Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today we have Ira Harris and John Brown. Ira is an independent floor trader, successful hedge fund manager, a global macro consultant trading foreign currencies, bonds, commodities, and equities for over 40 years. He was the CME director from 1997 to 2003. And John is the senior market strategist for Euro-Pacific Capital. He's a distinguished former member of Britain's parliament who served on the Treasury Select Committee as chairman of the Conservative Small Business Committee and also as a principal advisor to the British government on issues relating to geopolitical matters. He's Margaret. Worked, yeah, uh, Margaret Thatcher. And he's worked for Morgan Stanley as an investment banker, also worked for other firms, Barclays Bank and Citigroup. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Russell. Hello. And to Ira, Thanks, too. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, John, hello to you. And thank you, Richard, for having us. Uh, Great. Putting this together. So I thought we'd begin with a, um, uh, a discussion on um, the uh, the Chinese oil contract uh, uh, and, and just a general theme for today's discussion are undercurrents uh, geopolitically that are happening, which could have implications uh, and factors on the financial markets and the economy. Um, Ira, you've recently written that uh, on this um, – this new uh, oil, crude oil futures contract uh, that is priced in yuan and convertible to gold, gold. You wrote that China's ability to monetize gold is a direct assault on the U.S. ability to manipulate the global financial system to its advantage, a remnant of the Bretton Woods uh, post-World War II global system. Uh, just just uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, what, what, what do you think? Well, you know, I, as I said, as we've as we've had the breakdown of the system, and that's you know, this is all part parcel of what's taking place. You know, people who don't want to uh, admit, you know, admit to themselves that there are just major changes afoot. You know, we see what China is doing, and and I, and I'm not making a qualitative judgment one way or another. That's just you know, history. Um, and again, you know, I, I, I just finished reading um, uh, a book by uh, Giovanni Arrighi, you know, who people would, might find fault with him, that he's on the left, but uh, the long 20th 20, 20, uh, century. And it was there, there are just changes going on, and there's always changes going on in the international system. And the United States is seeing itself diminished as a global as the global hegemon, to use, you know, a Chinese phrase. So these things are taking place. And the Chinese, who are very astute, very astute global watchers, you know, you know, Richard, you and I have talked about this, and I know I think we got, we got into it last time, that when China, when NAFTA started in, in January 1st, 1994, on the day that NAFTA started, China devalued the yuan from five point. Eight to eight point seven, where they held it for a long time after that. But that was a fifty percent devaluation. The Chinese are very astute watchers of the world situation, and this is just more of that. And uh, John, you have also written about the the same subject um, about huge ramifications and a move that was little noticed outside of the financial world. Yes, well, interestingly enough, of course, uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, the, first of all, China is now the largest consumer of oil in the world, number one consumer, and its two largest suppliers are Saudi Arabia and Russia. So it's very interesting, just that fact alone is quite interesting when you think of the Saudi visit to uh, Russia. But what recently happened, and it's amazing that it missed most of the financial media, um, China created a domestic oil contract that would be traded internationally in one, the Chinese uh, commercial currency, and that one will be convertible into gold. In other words, people that 
receive one for their oil, like Saudi Arabia or uh, Saudi Ru Russia or any other country that sells them oil, maybe even Britain, uh, will be paid in one, not dollars. This is the crucial thing, because what happened in, uh, as um, Ira referred to after Bretton Woods, it was the reserve, uh, the dollar became the reserve currency, and most commodities in the world had to be priced in dollars. If it was a German, you had to buy dollars in order to buy pork bellies in the Chicago Exchange, etc. And what was most interesting was in the ni early 1970s when the oil crisis happened, uh, Dr. Kissinger flew into Saudi Arabia and managed to get to persuade the Saudis to persuade the rest of OPEC to only buy, only sell oil for dollars. In other words, no longer would sterling be any good or any other currencies to buy oil. Their oil was only to be sold into for dollars. And that, of course, underpinned the U.S. dollar and enabled the enormous expansion of dollar liquidity once the Nixon had broken the gold window in August of 1971 and underpinned it. Now, this very interesting thing here, because now Saudi Arabia that's stuffed full of dollars and other countries are stuffed full of dollars, particularly China, but say Saudi Arabia sells oil for one, we're now to be paid rather than dollars, and it can convert those one into gold. So uh, that's very attractive for all oil exporters to be exporting to China in its Chinese currency because unlike dollars, it's convertible into, into gold. And this is strikes exactly at what Ara was saying, the hegemony of the United States, the power that it was in 1944 at Bretton Woods. It was by far the most powerful economy in the world and the richest country. And then by 1945, the, the, the most powerful military nation on earth. And it's traded on that ever since. And uh, if you look at the depreciation of the dollar, since 1914, when the Federal Reserve Board opened its doors in January 1914, um, the dollar has depreciated by some 98% or more. In other words, uh, two cents of that dollar would buy you a present-day dollar. And sterling has been even worse because there were eight ster eight dollars to the sterling pound in those days. Now there's 1.2, <laughs> just over. And so you can see that sterling has virtually been depreciated over 99 percent. And yet nobody's noticed it because all the other currencies have depreciated too, or most of them, because they've all been valued in dollars, not in gold. And that particularly happened after 1971. And that's when the real amazing scam took place and today we're left with a world of seeming wealth but really just huge liquidity there are dollars swimming everywhere hence these stock markets are rising people got to put them to work or you've got negative real interest rates i mean the interest the inflation rate in or the interest rates uh in the u.s are about 1.5 percent and the inflation rate is two point just over two percent and uh, so there's a negative interest rate in the United States as well. And we've reached ridiculous things that people finding somewhere to put their money, even into junk bonds. I mean, in 2009, a junk bond traded at 25, a European junk bond traded at 25 percent interest yield or yield. Today, it yields less than a 10 year U.S. Treasury bill. I mean, it's 2.2 <laughs> yeah. as opposed to 2.3. And that can't go on. I mean, that just doesn't make sense. And it's a vast, vast bubble that when, it, when it's pricked eventually. And uh, one got little worries about it. The, you know, I'm, I think Trump's done a wonderful job in draining this, trying to drain this swamp and everything. But when he was in Puerto Rico, he said, oh, we may wipe out Puerto Rican debt. But you see, if he wipes out Puerto Rican debt, and we have great sympathy for these poor people who've been completely cheated by their government, local government and uh, their, their electrical system, a pathetic state even before the storm. Uh, but if that happens, people start saying, well, what about Illinois? What about California? What about New York? And, uh, the government going to wipe their debts? Uh, should I be buying that? And eventually... If you extend that argument still further, say, well, what about America? That maybe a president comes in here and said, we'll wipe out the debt. So you start to get a real beginning of a fear as to whether I should be buying A, to have dollars, or B, to be buying U.S. debt. And that is the beginning of the 
pricking of this vast balloon, in my opinion. Ira, thoughts on on that? Oh, I, yeah. I, I I agree with, with everything that John has said, especially that chart is when you look at the European high high yield index that yields less than U.S. ten year Treasuries, considered to be the safest debt in the world. If you don't think you have a problem, you must be a central banker. Uh, this is an enormous problem. And of course, you know, right now the, mar- the world marches on, but you know, so, so be it. That's the way the markets work. And, and of course we know that central banks, and I think we'd all agree, have broken the signaling mechanism of what bond markets are supposed to do. So where they would be offering us warning signals, they can't because you can't overcome that power of the uh their proverbial and it's more proverbial it's an actual printing press um where they can print and print and print and we know that money in a in a world in which capital flows freely all money is fungible there's nothing to stop it it is when you buy 60 billion a month in europe that money goes somewhere and uh it goes to buy other assets and so they're buying uh, all types of bonds. Um, so we, we have, we don't have a market price and, and, and we know that the central banks are the biggest fear is a lot is for them, for the market to take over the pricing mechanism because then it would reflect some sense of reality. As long as the central banks control it, then we, we don't have a sense of that reality. So, I mean, that's just the world in which we live in. And, and, and I think that John is 100% right, especially in what the Chinese want to do here. You know, this is not a mistake. And uh, I want to see what their next move is. It, it's interesting that Russia came out the other day. And they've created, they're creating their own cryptocurrency. So everybody is fine. You know, so there's going to be ruble cryptocurrency because ultimately if, if there are these um, uh, electronic uh, medium of exchange and what we call currency, it will be controlled by the governments. They will not let this out of their control. If they lose control of this, then, you know, look at you know, one of the mainstays of the U.S. Constitution is the government's ability to, uh, uh, you know, for currency and coinage. Yeah. So they will lose control of it. But when we really look at it, and I think this is where John goes, because if we go back to the 1960s, the late 50s, the 60s, when Jacques Roof was writing the sin of the, monet- the monetary sin of the West, and and he was calling into question, because what we had was not a gold standard, we had a gold exchange standard, that the United States was willing to exchange gold for currencies until, of course, the Vietnam War and the War on Poverty began. And then there was just too much currency hooks so changed. So Nixon was said, "Hey, they can kill us here. So we got to get off this standard." Um, it's the same thing, really. If you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin is nothing but a dollar exchange standard because it's not like Bitcoins are their own currency. It's not like somebody's created a currency out of nothing. If you buy Bitcoins, you're exchanging some underlying value. You might be exchanging gold. You might be, but most of the time you're exchanging dollars for those bitcoins because they're always valued in dollars. The Chinese are really going to try hard to take us away from that. Um, and they, they've, and I think John's point, and you know, Rich, I wrote about that too. I thought that was an amazingly important article that what China is doing and that we have to be very attentive to it. And, uh, uh, yeah, go, uh, go ahead. What I said, I, I think, is so interesting um, because uh, I, I, what we've got is an illusion of wealth and a, an unreality, and that's the awful thing. These governments and central banks have just created this incredible unreality, and I mentioned those differences in yield, which are just beyond belief. But the, the thing is that um, when we go back to, the, say, the gold standard that we had, before there was real money because of the gold standard before the first world war and what i find fascinating is that it had a rule of money there was a sort of rule of law within money but it translated into international rule of law there was a rule of law uh, there was very few wars when the international currency came in based on gold and it was only when we broke from gold that we suddenly unleashed huge amounts of unrest and irregularity and 
breaking of the law. I mean, the law is broken by the government all the time. I mean, just look at the illegal immigration. Look at this new secret funding of Obamacare, illicit and unconstitutional, but it still was accepted by all these uh, um, rhino politicians, you know, who, who, who are so corrupt. And it's corrupted the thing, and that populations are getting very violent, very depressed, angry with each other. It's it's a great shame, and I think it's because we live in a world of unreality. And uh, you know, Ira mentioned cryptocurrencies. Of course, this is a fantastic thing. A Bitcoin plus its blockchain methodology has is an offer to clear the swamp, the financial swamp. I mean. Uh, President Trump is trying to clear the political swamp in America, but the financial swamp is almost more severe. And uh, it offers the individual freedom from government, instant transactions under digital transactions at no cost and uh, and, and a tremendous degree of anonymity. I, I think it's a fantastic revolution that's taking place. And that's Bitcoin, which, of course, is becoming the... Reserve currency, as it were, or reserve cryptocurrency of the 1,200, roughly 1,200 cryptocurrencies. They all translate or measured against Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is measured in dollars at the moment. So it's a fascinating thing taking place. And blockchain, which is the technology behind it, is, is, is going to challenge governments and major corporations of how they do business. It's going to almost de redefine, in my view, capitalism because it's going to be a completely new way of doing it uh, on blockchain, devoid of regulations where there's so much more freedom of the individual. And I, I think uh, we're heading for a time of phenomenal change in the financial world uh, because of blockchain. And, of course, all the big financiers, including Jamie Dimon, who I like tremendously and is a tremendous guy, <laughs> but they're all decrying Bitcoin and all this stuff because there, it's such a threat to the financial system that we've got now, which is so expensive. And, you know, the average bank is charging you for everything. They used to do everything just to have your money on interest deposit. They used to give you a decent rate of interest, and all the services were free. Now you're charged for everything, even a wiring, $15 to wire money. It's just staggering when it's all digital stuff and very easy. I doubt if it costs 15 cents, but it's charged <laughs> okay. And yeah. so... So all these things are going to change, in my view. If you just imagine 1850 compared to 1950, who could have imagined in 1850 electricity and <laughs> machine guns and all this sort of stuff? I mean, it was fantastic change in life, and I think we're going to experience that in the next few years. And one of the leading things is going to be the technology behind Bitcoin, um, the, the blockchain. It's going to transform the world. I mean, it's... Uh, going to really face these big corporate, not just governments, but corporations on their whole business models. I mean, you think the Internet was bad enough for brick and mortar uh, companies and, uh, and we're now seeing, but blockchain is phase two of the Internet and it's going to be an even bigger challenge for commerce and the whole of capitalism. So I think um, we're going to see a, a sort of reversal and a technological draining of the financial swamp uh, and of course it has huge implications for the Wall Street, the city of London and every other financial centre because if I come along and I dial up Gemini.com uh, and I uh, deposit uh, $10,000 into an account there which I've opened and they do due diligence takes a few days to open the account because they check you out, know your customer they do all that by regulation and to avoid money laundering, etc., etc., I put the ten thousand dollars in and convert it into some Bitcoin, and that money has come out of the banking system. So no longer is it in deposit and leveraged up to make loans; it's gone into the banking system. It's dead money. And when this catches on, at the beginning it was so difficult to get into Bitcoin, everything, but it's getting very simple now. And if you don't leave the money on an exchange, and some of these ex Bitcoin exchanges or crypto exchanges have been hacked, you put it in your wallet, it's entirely secure. And my God, you've got to remember your password, just like you have to remember your, your numbered account in Switzerland, or it vanishes. So, so the, the, um, the, the thing is going to change, and what it's going to do is create dead money in the banking system. In other words, taking deposits out of the banks, and they're going to be really strapped. 
So I think this is a Bitcoin is a major, major uh, uh, economic uh, threat to bursting the balloon. And then people with Bitcoin, Bitcoin, of course, would rise phenomenally if money collapses a fiat currency. It's the only way you can get into cryptocurrency is through Bitcoin. None of the other cryptocurrencies accept fiat money. You can put fiat money, in other words, dollars into Bitcoin and then from Bitcoin into the other cryptocurrencies. But so this is going to siphon money out of the banking system. It's going to siphon money uh, that people feel is real money and a combination of, say, Bitcoin and, and gold. Uh, with the Bitcoin being much more mobile and easily moved around the world at no cost, is a, is a thing I see of the future resulting from the swindle that people have been had by their governments and the banking system. And that's that could prick the balloon. Uh, speaking of the move away from dollars, uh, we talked about the Chinese. Uh, uh, do you think the Russians may move away from accepting dollars for oil? Uh, they already... They already have done the deals with China. China, that was the ridiculous thing about forcing the Russians that Obama did over, over the Crimea. Instead of seeing that the Crimea was to Russia as uh, the Cuba was to the United States under Kennedy, when Khrushchev put his missiles in there underneath the soft belly of America next to Florida, it, Amer Kennedy had to get them out, even if it meant going to nuclear war. He simply couldn't accept those missiles sitting that close with such a short time fuse uh, to get in the United States. He couldn't accept it. So he had to get it back. And luckily, Khrushchev realized that, climbed down, and the tit for tat was that America removed its mes missiles from Turkey, the soft underbelly of the United States. But Obama and Kerry hadn't read their history, and they didn't see that Crimea... And um, the Ukraine was a similar thing for Russia. And instead of accepting it and finding some weasel words typical of politicians to get over this problem, they forced Russia out and into the hands of the Chinese, where we've spent ages trying to leave them away from the Chinese. And now Russia no, makes no bones about being awkward with, with us. And one of the things they've done is tied up huge deals with China in their mutual currencies and avoiding the U.S. dollar. So they're, they're out. I mean, one of the things to break America, it's very interesting. We've piled up huge amounts of money in military systems and very advanced uh, military, but maybe the, the, the Achilles heel for the Western world is its money, uh, not its armed forces, because if China could break the dollar and China and Russia could break the dollar, they'd smash America without firing a shot. And the, the great generals are the ones that win without actually fighting. They, you Like chess, you threaten the king with a checkmate. You don't even have to take him. He can't move. And that's the, the game of the ultimate strategies is to win with the minimum of fighting. And the Chinese could be doing that, etching at our currencies, fiat currencies. And when we talk in trillions, I mean, a billion is a lot to get your mind around. I mean, I've seen a football crowd at Wembley Stadium of 100,000, and that's a huge number. Billion is way out of my comprehension. I was head to a funeral in South Korea. There were said to be a, a million people at the funeral. I was sitting next to Casper Weinberger. Even then, you can only see the sides of the crowd. It's wrong. You can't see a million. A trillion, a trillion seconds ago was 31 and a half thousand years ago. An American government owes 20 trillion direct debt and about another trillion in un, unfunded liabilities and guarantees. So these are staggering figures, and people have no comprehension. It's the big game of bluff that's been run by the governments and the central banks. People, the ordinary people have no idea. And if that bubble was to burst, the abject poverty that should be wreaked upon everyone as they searched for what Ira said right at the very beginning, a search for market value of real value, is so way below these prices in almost everything. And we said, what would China do next after oil? What about copper? probably the most widely used uh, natural resource in the world other than water of raw materials for production. It's copper. And if they die for oil for this uh, um, instrument, why not do the same thing for copper if, if uh, the oil one is successful and then gradually spread it around? Who would be buying dollars to buy any commodities? You'd, you'd kill the dollar, and with the dollar, you'd kill the United States. 
And uh, Ira, what are your thoughts on the Russians moving away from accepting dollars for oil, the potential for that? Um, you, you recently pointed out the um, the Saudi king f- first ever official visit mm-hmm. to Russia. Yeah, John. John talked about that. He alluded to it. That was. That's not a. See, these are major events. These are so far more important. Whatever Trump tweets, the Saudi king going to Russia first time ever. That's an enormous event. That's a signaling event. That, actually, the, actually. That's that's a pivot. And when John talks about Obama and Kerry, they, they had no idea what was going on because I love when John talks about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Listen. Well, as I've said to anybody, go read probably the best book of political science was, you know, Graham Allison's The Essence of Decision. And you'd understand, first of all, everything that's going on in Washington anyway, because it's the greatest study of bureaucratic politics. And it's acknowledges that. And he, in fact, he rewrote a version in 1999. I mean, it's, it's brilliant. This is all that's going on. But Obama and Kerry dropped the ball. First, because the Russians are never going to give up the Crimea. You know, people don't understand why. Why is there Guantanamo Bay in Cuba? Why does the United States still have a naval base in Cuba? Because Cuba protects New Orleans, and New Orleans is the grain shipping capital of the world. It, Cuba protects the entire Gulf of, of Mexico, which is huge for oil and 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 food. Just like Crimea, if you look at a map, Crimea. And why did the Russians always want a base in Crimea? Because it allows it to either threaten or protect the whole Straits of Bosporus. You know, forget Turkey. When the Russians want to shut that down, they can shut that down. And that's why you're not going to move them out of Crimea. But people don't ever look at a map. And so much of this becomes just logic. But the Russians learned a lot from Obama. You know, they first saw that red line, and they saw all the weaknesses and all the apologies and all the. So they they just kept moving in, they just kept moving in and moving in. And uh, when what's her name uh, tried to uh, excite, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, she was the uh, uh, ambassador in, in Ukraine. Um, oh God, I forget. I'm, I apologize. Uh, it'll come to me by the end. I guarantee you. And, you know, uh, she was trying to incite Putin uh, with the whole uh, uh, revolution. Putin, Putin played that exactly. And, he, and, he, and then John McCain, the idiot. I'm sorry, John, I used to respect you. But when you want to give the Ukrainians advanced weaponry, you're setting them up for massacre. Because Putin was only waiting for that to happen. So you back off of that, and you know things have quieted in Ukraine because the Russian the, the Russians have the eastern part, and they have their people in, and you know it'll it'll work itself through. But the world is the world is fascinating, and all these things with the oil, yeah, the Russians are going to squeeze this too, which is why they're working with the Saudis because the Saudis need the Russians now that the Russians are in control of Syria, and if they're going to prevent, you know, what the Saudis fear most, of course, is the uh, the the, uh, Shia, the Shia crescent that extends out of Iran across across Iraq into Lebanon, you know, with uh, Hezbollah, and they want to put they want to have some they want the Russians because they know now the Russians the Russians are the are the key player there, not the United States. As soon as the Russians took back that uh, that naval base. Uh, in um, you know in in Syria, it was a major game changer. And John Kerry, you know, he he was ridiculous. They had they had no plan, and they got totally blindsided by the events that unfolded. So all of this, there, and to me, and and I'm gonna we'll see what John says about this. The greatest wild card in the game, the greatest wild card for the Russians, is Ger- Gerhard Schroeder. He has an enormous position now. It wasn't before; it was just the pipelines, but now they've actually brought him in, you know, to Rusnev as a major uh, director. Uh, are you kidding me? This is a guy who was the chancellor. This would be like George W. Bush, be you know, serving on the board of Gazprom. Uh, you know, you'd have to stand up and wait. There are things afoot here that are so big that nobody nobody's paying attention to them, and they will unfold. Uh, how? What's going to be the market dynamic? I don't know, but 
I know these things are in motion, and we have to be very attuned to them. Yes, that Gerhard Schroeder thing is fascinating um, because obviously Russia and Germany have, have always had a huge trade. And when the sanctions came on organized by Obama, of course, uh, the United States did only less than a fifth of the amount of dollar volume trade with Russia than Germany did. And so it hurt Germany far more. And that threatened to break NATO because the Germans didn't want to go ahead with these sanctions. That was a threat to NATO, would have split NATO, and that would have been very, very bad. But it risked it. And uh, eventually Merkel uh, kowtowed and obeyed what Obama and Kerry had, had wanted. But it was a, a dangerous time. And the Gerhard Schroeder thing illustrates this. And uh, the, the, the great weakness. I, I'm appalled when I think, uh, you know, the government here is focused on trying to fix uh, a Russian allegation on the president. Um, and uh, meddling around in these silly, unbelievable investigations of people while the big crooks go. And uh, these huge events are happening in the world and nothing seems to be done. But I think people are getting really fed up, really fed up. They're sick of being financially swindled by their governments and seeing their living standards work, fall. I mean, now, when I first came to Wall Street in 1969, most people had one family breadwinner. Now both parents have to work to have a living wage, and yet this huge uh, wealth, this illusion of wealth is there, but really at the grassroots level, ordinary people are being really squeezed to death. And I think they're getting very fed up with that and also with their governments doing things that people now, thanks especially to the Internet, are seeing things happen in the world which are totally against their interests and the government are doing it. It started with a big rebellion in Britain and with Brexit. It started, the second thing was the election of President Trump. The people spoke. The, the financial elite were absolutely staggered that he won, and they, as they were staggered by the victory of Brexit. And now you see Catalonia wanting to leave in Spain. You saw the same sort of problem in Greece, in Italy, and then in the German elections, the huge movement of the right from zero to 88 seats. Um, uh, in, in the Bundestag. I, I'm from zero with everybody just a month before the election saying, well, we we'll never let one of them in. They'll, they'll never get one seat. They got 88 seats. And now you see in Austria the similar sort of thing. The people are speaking and they're very, very fed up with their governments. And I believe as I went back to that gold story, when you dilute and you create uh, turmoil with the money system, it eventually spread into the political system. And where we had gold, there was rule, law and order within money. And when it, that vanished, the law and order on the streets broke down. And in society, just the way of behavior, let alone the crime on the street. And it's now reached a, a fever pitch. And people who have to live on the streets, I mean, our leaders live in limousine-driven, chauffeur-driven cars and police escorts and everything else. Ordinary people have to live with their children going to school uh, down streets, which are dangerous. And they're uh, beginning to speak. And I think uh, all these things are beginning to reach a crescendo, which is extremely worrying. And uh, Ira, you've written about the uh, Sunday election in Austria as well. Ooh, yeah. uh, just yeah. wondering your thoughts on that. You also mentioned financial repression will be the next theme for the European right. Oh, yeah, there's no question. And I know John from what I've read of his and, and, and heard him speak, I mean, that's, that's exactly, you know, the, the media and the established elites and what, wherever that means, but, but it exists. And, you know, I call it the Davos crowd, you know, who, uh, who meet amongst themselves and, and proclaim their own self-importance, but they want to make it into anti-immigration. It's so much more than that. If you pay attention, I mean, Today, you know, the German court decided, and I was, you know, I read a little bit of the ruling of Carl's rule, uh, and they basically sided with what the ECB is doing up to a point. But this isn't going to stay that way forever because, you know, what's his name, um, who was the original founder of the AF, uh, the AFD, uh, Bernd, uh, uh, the, the economist, uh, you know, they were all economists. And, and yes, they got sidetracked, you know, because uh, Merkel made that terrible decision about open immigration and, 
and they attracted some, but there are, there are things that are going to re-rise because they're not going to back off of this. And, and if the FDP is brought in and Linda gets the financial ministership, this is going to be a, a continued issue because German citizens are paying by design, by design, they are paying for the entire bailout of Europe. And yeah. you know what? Right, right now, because the world has enough growth, it, they're able to, you know, to, to smooth it over. But that's not going to last long either. You know, Japan was able to go through a terrible uh, period of non-growth or very low growth, but a lot of that was because the rest of the world was, was expanding, you know, so you, that alleviated a lot of problems. Japan had more problems, of course, when the world went into a major recession in 08, 09, you know, uh, so these things, you know, it, it, again, you, you know, it, it, Ben Hunt, you know, from Epsilon Theory writes, writes about it continuously. It's the narrative. And do I accept the narrative? that the mainstream, uh, and it's not like I'm a, a fanatic, I'm not, but I read everything that I can because um, I need to in order to, to prosper what I do. But it's, I don't, I don't accept that narrative because there's underlying things that are far more powerful going on and it, it's outside of the narrative that they want to concoct as the way the world is. And you know, it's, it's just, it's just not so. There's, there's so much disruption going on. And now, you know, we've got the Chinese, uh, you know, their five-year uh, meeting with, with Xi and what will come out of there. And, of course, we have the Japanese elections. But the Austrian elections were very important because, you know, as, as John was talking about, you the rise of the right there, this is the second time. The first time was back, of course, when the euro was coming into existence and the Austrian people were not enamored with it. And what we got, Jörg Haider, you know, who who was shunned by the rest of Europe. You know, it's harder to shun people now because you've got the Catalans, you've got Brexit, you've got Poland, who's not very happy with the way things are. You have other of the Eastern European members of the of the EU who are not very happy. There's a lot of underlying unhappiness. And Merkel is is a right now is in a very wounded position. The only thing that can salvage her is, would be if she created another grand coalition with the SPD. But uh, the SPD, who just won an election that they weren't supposed to do very well in, they have no desire, and and, and they've said that you know they'd rather they do better as an out party than they do as a part of the coalition. So she's in a very precarious situation here. This will be interesting to watch. Uh, John, your final thoughts. We're just coming up to a time crunch, but uh, final thoughts by John. Well, I, I, well, I think, you know, just listening to Ira, I, I, I agree with everything he said. I mean, what, what I see happening now is that, as I've said before, I think my summary feeling is that we have this illusion of wealth based on, on really an illusion and that we've built this massive bubble, thanks to the Fed and the other central banks that have followed suit, absolutely gigantic, trillions of dollars of hot air, really. Um, and if that was to go, I mean, uh, the higher you've gone the, and, and the balloon goes, the, the more devastating the fall. And we are really high up at the moment. I mean, the 23,000 stock market and everything. I, I, I think it's, it's just shocking the way people have been treated. But I and um, what's really worrying is that people now are beginning to act. They've seen it, and uh, if the balloon is picked, is pricked because of their actions on the street, and they get politicians in here that really will prick the balloon, um, it's going to be a very nasty f financial situation. Well, uh, great insight, uh, gentlemen. Uh, how can our listeners learn more about your work, Ira? Well, Notes from Underground is uh, available if you go to Ira Harris, Y-R-A-H-A-R-R-I-S dot com, and you, you and Notes from Underground will, cl uh, will click up and you can subscribe to it. It's, it costs you less than a crypto coin. Oh, it costs nothing. Uh, well, maybe one peso, maybe equivalent of a peso. Oh, uh, very minimist. And so uh, you, you can find me there, and there's a lot of dialogue that goes on. And John? 
Well, I write for Euro Pacific Capital on their internet, which is europac.net, not .com, but europac.net. And um, my articles are on there together with those of Peter Schiff on the cover page. Um, so that's probably the best way, other than lectures that I give every, every now and again. <laughs> but, and, of course, your wonderful podcast. <laughs> well, great. Th- thank you very much, gentlemen, for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, John. Pleasure. Yep. Look forward to it again. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk. 